Guten Morgen, liebe Ecclesia Kirche. So, good morning, Ecclesia Church. Oh, you can do better than that. Good morning, Ecclesia Church. It's wonderful to see you. Warm welcome to everyone. It's so great to have such wonderful weather. We're just having a, a great day to have a party. We also have guests of honor today. Please give them a round of applause. The children are with us in the whole service today. They're our guests. We're going to do something different today, and I need your help. So this is something different way today for me today because on one hand I'm talking to the children and we're doing kind of a children's sermon, but also I'm talking to adults at the same time. I'm used to preaching mostly to the adults in the, in the main service here. So Jesus said, you know, let the children come to me. I mean, he was all for children uh, listening to him teach and preach and and so we would like to have a service today where the children are integrated into the service. And I, I see that kids, you're, you're kind of dispersed here in the front, but I would like you to get together real close right in front of me and uh, because you're going to be a team. You're going to do some teamwork together. And as a team, I'm going to be asking you at different times during this message, I'm going to do different blocks, and then I'm going to take a break and ask you questions. And you guys have to figure out as a team what the answer is. And one particular brave person can come up then to the microphone and tell us the answer. So, are you ready? Good. So we're going to have a, a test question just to see if you know if you're in tune with how we're going to do this. The first question is: the Bible is divided into two big sections. What are they called? Dis discuss it among yourselves. What do you think the answer is? Are you agreed? What, what do you think the answer is? Okay, I, several people that raised their hands, so this will Girl said the New and the Old Testament. Yay, she got it right. Great. So you guys did a great job figuring out the test question, the, the very first one, to, to see if you know how we're going to do this. So you listen very closely, because I'll be telling a story now, and then I'll ask you some questions. You know, I think the Bible is really exciting. There are so many wonderful things to learn and, and discover. There are great stories in there from simple people like you and I. But God worked really amazing things through them. And there's one story that I love more than a lot of them. It's just so wonderful. And I'd like to tell you about this story today. And I believe that we can learn something from it for our lives. So I would like to read a couple of verses from this first section out of the Bible, namely the Old Testament. And I'm sure that you'll probably figure out really quickly who this story is talking about. So the very first book in the Old Testament is called Genesis, right? And in chapter 37 of this big book, it says, Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. And this is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, 
the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Silpah, his father's wives. And he brought their father a bad report about them. He was a real tattletale. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made a really fancy, ornate robe for him. And when his brothers, 11 brothers, he had 11 brothers, imagine that, saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him. And they could not speak a kind word to him. Isn't that awful? And Joseph had a dream and he told it to his brothers. And after that, they hated him all the more. You know, dreams are really crazy sometimes. Most of the time, you wake up and you think, oh, what in the world was I dreaming about last night? Sometimes I can't even figure out what I was dreaming about. Or sometimes it was really nice, but I can't, I can't really tell why I dreamt about it, you know. Or sometimes it's nice things, sometimes not so nice things. But Joseph had a dream, and he remembered it, and he decided to tell it to his brother. But after he did, they hated him all the more. And let's look at the dream that he had. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field. When suddenly my sheaf, you know, and, and these sheaves of grain, you have these uh, single grains of grass, you know, these pieces of, of grain, and, and you tie them together with one of the strands. And so that makes a sheaf. And we were binding these sheep, and suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright. And then your sheaves gathered around mine and bound down to it. And his brothers figured it out right away. They were, they said to him, you intend to reign over us. Do you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. And then a little bit later, he had a second dream. He dreamt that the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to him. But this time he didn't just tell his brothers, he also told his father. And his father rebuked him and said, hey, what is this dream you have? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? Nobody really understood what was going on. Even Joseph didn't really understand it. So now we're question again, the question for the kids. The question is, how many sheaves and how many stars were falling down to Joseph? Oh, you don't even let me finish the question hardly, and you're raising your hands. Eleven stars and eleven sheaves. Right, good job. Oh, these questions, they must be way too easy for you smart kids. So, Joseph had these dreams, right? And, and he had told his brothers about it. And a little bit later, then the brothers were out taking care of the sheep. They were out someplace in the countryside, and they were gone quite a while. And Joseph's father was wondering, you know, Jacob, he was wondering how everybody was doing. And if everything was okay, if the sheep were doing okay, if they were having any problems. And so he decided to send Joseph, and he sent him with, with a lunch package for a picnic or whatever, you know, so he had something to eat. And he said, check out, you know, where your brothers are and ask them how they're doing, give them something to eat here. 
And Joseph didn't know where to look, but he ran into a, a guy on, on the way and he asked him and this person was actually able to tell him which direction the brothers had gone with their sheep. So he followed that and he was very thankful. And so the brothers, they did see Joseph coming in their direction. And when they saw him, to carry on with the story here, when they saw him in the distance before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of those cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into this cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this because he wanted to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. And Joseph, he was so happy to see his brothers. He said, oh, I'm so glad I found them and I can finally ask them how they're doing and give them these, these things from dad and everything. And what happened? They, they charged on him and they, they took off his beautiful clothes. He had this wonderful cloak that his dad had made him. And, the wonderful colors and fancy and everything, and then they threw him into a dry. And and all of a sudden, a caravan was coming by that had some some people that were uh, selling things, and and the brother said, "Hey, you know, what good does it do to kill him? We do, there's no profit in that, but we could sell him to these to these people that are are going with our caravan and." and trying to sell their wares in Egypt when he could go to Egypt and he could be sold into slavery, you know, and he'd be worth some money. And so what did they do? They they sold him. And they said here in the Bible that they sold him for 12 silver pieces, which is about 240 grams or about eight ounces of silver. And so here there's a, there's a, a can that has about 240 grams of coins in it. It's not very heavy, is it? You know, that's about as heavy as those coins would have been. One kilo or 2.2 pounds of pure silver runs around 800 euros or at the most like a thousand dollars. And here they were only getting 240 grams of it and not a kilo. And so, so like about eight ounces, and that would be, who knows, maybe $210 or something, 192 euros. I mean, for children, that's a lot of money. That's a big number. But when you consider that there were 11 brothers and each of them had to have their fair share out of it, they were each of them only giving seven euros and 64 cents, which would mean maybe in dollars, maybe nine dollars, each one of the brothers. Isn't that awful? I mean, that's crazy to think you'd sell your own brother and only see like nine dollars a piece for, for your own brother. But that's what happened. And so he came to Egypt and he was a slave and he no longer was a free person. He can no longer say, I want to do this or I want to do that. No, they maybe took him to the to the downtown and, and put him in the marketplace and, and somebody decided to, to buy him. But the brothers did decide to tell their father a lie about the wild animal and, and that that was what happened to him and, and the wild animal carried him off and they haven't seen from him again. And of course the dad, he was he was so sad and he was grieving and nobody could come for him. This was just awful. So the next question for the kids, which brother tried to save Joseph? Which one? Do you remember the name? Oh, we want to know. 
was it? Oh, yes, you got it right. It was Ruben. Good job. Yeah, Ruben, Ruben tried. He tried to save his brother. He, he wanted to, you know, come and get him later. But that didn't work out. So Joseph was seriously taken as a slave to Egypt. And in Egypt, when he got there, Joseph went to a marketplace and, and people looked at him and somebody said, yeah, I could use him, you know, in my household. He could do this and this for a job. And I could, I could use somebody to do that. And the person that bought Joseph was Potiphar. And he was a rich man. And he had this money because he was one of the best officials, one of the highest officials under the pharaoh, who was kind of like the king or whatever of the country. He was he was running the whole show down there. And and this was a one of his top men working for him. So it was more like he was the one that the Potiphar was the one that was in in charge of all the guards in in the house of of Potiphar, yeah, of, of Pharaoh, the royal guards, guardian bodyguards, whatever. So, you know, how would it be for Joseph there? I mean, he doesn't know the the culture, he doesn't know the language. He, he doesn't know how, what they do, anything, but he had to learn everything, just like a little kid, just like a baby almost. He had to learn everything. And he did. It, it says a little bit later in chapter 39, the Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. I, I think that's amazing that it says that Potiphar didn't worry about anything he had to worry about is didn't even have to worry about it, but his only care was what he was going to eat imagine that i mean that's kind of the way the kids live you know they don't have to worry about how the yard gets mowed or how the laundry gets washed or who's going to make money and whatever uh, kids don't worry about it but ask your parents you know, do they have to figure it all out? Of course they do. They can't just say, oh, I'm the only thing I'm going to think about is the food we eat. So here's the next question. Why was Joseph so successful in his work? And the kids had the right answer, because God helped him. Oh, you guys are way too good here. Joseph was with, God was with Joseph in Egypt. And even when his brothers had, had yeah, left him alone, had abandoned him, God hadn't. He didn't leave him. You know, the story about Joseph isn't here right, uh, at the end. He, he has a lot more that goes on in his life. It, it gets even worse, if you can imagine that. He's, he's charged wrongly for doing something and uh, thrown into jail. But even in jail, God was with him and, and made him a blessing to people and, and was helping him. So if we only look at the story this far, what can we learn from it? We can learn 
that no matter what con the circumstances are, whatever is going around around us, that God is with us and everything that we need, we will have it. God will be with us and he'll take care of it. Even with your friends or your family turn against you and, and you feel like you're a prisoner and, and all these things going on around you are terrible. God is there and he's going to help you. You know, God helped Joseph so much and he, and he helped tell him that there was going to be a period of starvation in the land where, where the crops would fail and everything and there wouldn't be that much to eat. And, and he told Joseph that ahead of time. And not only because of that, uh, but Joseph was also giving by God a strategy. He was given wisdom. And so he came back to a position of authority and he helped the country prepare so that nobody had to starve. There was food stored up to get them through this terrible period when, when crops didn't grow and there weren't cattle to eat and whatever. And so, you know, Jesus, Joseph is, is like a, a savior for his family and for the other people in the story. But he is also a wonderful picture of how the Lord Jesus Christ is for us. You know, we sometimes think about what's going to happen in the future. How, how are we going to, you know, make it? How, how are things going to be provided? But, you know, everything did happen like those dreams said. The brothers did come to him later and, and bowed down before him. They didn't realize that Joseph was a brother at the time. But they did that because he was the one that was saving the whole country, saving his family and the country by by having stored up food. And and he did what was necessary to to provide and, and to bring support for these people. And so they bowed down before him. And also his, his father did. And there are a lot of parallels that uh, theologians, uh, preachers, pastors, uh, people that study the Bible that they see between Joseph in the Old Testament and Jesus in the New Testament. Uh, things that they see, for example, is that Joseph was loved greatly by his father and Jesus was greatly loved by his. Joseph was rebuked by his brothers or rebuked his brothers because they were acting sinfully. They were doing wrong things. And Jesus also told people when they were doing things that were wrong in God's sight. But that, of course, made him hated by his brothers who didn't want to hear that. And he was thrown to the enemies. He was sold to the to enemies. And the same thing happened to Jesus. Uh, Joseph was unjustly punished. Jesus also. But later, Joseph was restored to his position and exalted and became a, a savior of the world that that all everyone came to him and he gave them things to eat. He gave them grain and they could make bread. And that's what Jesus did for us too. He worked miracles. He multiplied bread. He said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. You know, I don't know how how your life looks right now. Jesus is there to help us have a, a true fulfillment in our life, like like bread would give if if we were starving and 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 have a good meal. And and you might get out of bed in the morning. You say, "Oh, what a wonderful day! Another day in paradise!" And, Wonderful. Great. We're going to go get this. Or maybe you've got a lot of things going on in your life and you just don't know which way is up and you don't know how you're going to get through the day. It's, it's a real question. And, you know, Jesus is there. And 
he offers you a real life. He, he gives you what you need and trust in him. Put your life in his hands. Come to Jesus and believe in him. He said, whoever comes to me, I will not turn away. He doesn't force you to come to him. He doesn't grab you. He, he doesn't hold you so you can't run away. He doesn't do any of that, but he opens his arm and he offers his love. He offers his, his support, his guidance. I, I just want to invite you to take a moment and consider this invitation of Jesus. Close your eyes for a minute. Don't think about the people around you to the right or left or any commotion in the room. Just think about your life and what's going on. And we believe Jesus is here. Just look away from circumstances in your life for a moment and consider Joseph when he was in a terrible situation he always looked to God he found his anchor his hope in God no matter what was going on around him and if you feel that in your heart that God is calling you, God wants to help you. Maybe your heart's kind of pumping hard, you're throbbing, your face is turning red. Maybe maybe it's just a quiet feeling inside and you say, yeah, that's right. God is, God wants to help me. I want to let God help me. Then if that's you, raise your hand. Thank you. Dear Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for Joseph that we've read about, that we've heard about. And just as he was a savior for his people, for the people of his time, so you are a savior for us. We have hunger. We are very hungry. We, we search for something that will fulfill us, that will give us a foundation and strength to go on. We, we look all over the place, but you're the only way. And we want to ask you to come into our life, to forgive us for everything we've done and, and accept us and, and that we could have a relationship with you. You are alive today. You're calling us and we want to answer yes. And we all say, Amen. Amen.